we will move on now uh, to Eric Borwinkel, who will speak for 15 minutes on finding rare variants contributing to complex disease risk. Thank you, Eric. The floor is yours. Thanks. I'm going to speak quickly for 15 minutes. So now I divided this into a series of, of kind of questions. Um, first, I have colleagues, basically rare variants, who cares, particularly clinical and epidemiologic colleagues, you know, basically, you know, they say, well, I've never seen such and such disease, and I treat hypertensives every day. And I, and I think that definitely misses the point, and we've, we've beat this pony um, pretty hard. You know, the, I think the point about PCSK9, though, that hasn't been made yet, it's, it's not enough just to show that it reduces LDL cholesterol in this case. These are these loss of function mutations. For those of you who don't know this story, so these are, are African-American ERIC study participants, and you can see that there are loss of function variants that lower LDL cholesterol, but more importantly is they lower cardiovascular disease risk. So it's, you're not just lowering the quantitative trait, it actually translates into a clinical outcome. And I, I think that closes the story, and, and these individuals we're following very closely, and we've brought them back in on multiple occasions and phenotyping them more carefully, so we can definitively publicly say that they don't seem to have adverse um, other traits. You know, they don't. It's, they don't have obvious adverse other traits, but we're looking at them very, very carefully. And, and not only that, is you know, pharma has jumped all over this to, to identify novel therapeutics. This is actually a poster. There was a, a meeting, I believe it was in October, in the Nature Center. So there are a number of people now looking for inhibitors of PCSK9 because, not that it just lowers LDL cholesterol, it lowers LDL cholesterol, one, Two, it lowers cardiovascular disease risk. And three, is the individuals that carry these mutations seem to be um, phenotypically and clinically within the normal range. So you put it, putting all three of those things together, not any one of them, I think it makes a very nice um, druggable target. The other one is how many are there? Um, we get asked this question a lot. And this is a slide from uh, uh, the ESP exome data set that I, I like. Is, there are a number of, of metrics down on this x-axis of total diversity in, in a sample or in an individual averaged over um, in individuals in the sample. And what you can do then is just partition that metric, whatever metric you decide on, into, into the contribution from various bins. And what you can see is, you notice the bulge at the top, that the contribution of, of low frequency and rare variants to the total diversity in the sample is pretty high. And so even though, you know, it's fairly flat in that middle range, but um, a large amount of the total genetic diversity in the sample is attributable to these um, rare and low frequency variants. And what's amazing to me still, having done this now for several years, is we, the more individuals you sequence, the more and, and novel rare variants that you identify. And these are uh, two different ways of looking at it, e either, you know, fairly tight target on very many individuals or a broader target or the, the curve looks the same even even entire exomes is is that if you just look at the accumulation of variants numbers of variants here it seems to seems to increase and I'm not sure if it would ever plateau except for every nucleotide in the genome is at one point or in some individual is is variable and so there, there is an argument then for sequencing very large numbers of individuals because as you sequence, at least within the ranges we're working with today, which are still very large numbers, by the way, um, we are still identifying novel rare variants that we had not seen uh, before. The other reason that we're interested in low frequency and rare variants is they tend to be deleterious. And this graph shows basically that the proportion of variants in the, in the bin that are predicted, these are by computerized prediction algorithms now, they're predicted to be deleterious, and then looking at those that are low frequency and those that, that, that are fairly common. And you can see the proportion that, uh, that are predicted to be deleterious in this rare and low frequency bin is quite high. Where did they come from? Well, obviously they came from mutation, but it's a little more complicated than that. Is, you know, where, why are there so many of them here? And the, this is a, a nice sort of cartoon or character of human population expansion from a paper by Boyko, and there, there are several versions of this. And what we can see is obviously modern humans 
have 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 grown, uh, you know, super exponentially in in modern time, and, and you know, we have we have expanded as a, as a species throughout the globe in a very short uh, time frame. And what that means basically is by rapid population expansion, at least intuitively, so the population geneticist bites your lower lip, intuitively at least, is we've, we've overcome in some way the role of purifying selection by this rapid population expansion. And so we're able to have, again, as a collection of individuals, we're able to have a, a large number of these deleterious variants that are still in, 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 in the sample. And, and the way I look at this then from a, you know, from when you have a, a sample of individuals is, is looking at, at where these people come from is, you know, we, we all know about de novo mutations basically down here and, and many of us are looking at the role, particularly in dominant disease, of new, new de novo mutations of finding disease. But, the, but then you, you've going back into fairly recent, you know, recent history is you, you, you can re really think of us then as a very large pedigree, and you have these low frequency and rare variants, and you can actually, you know, the, the Brownings and Bruce Weir have leveraged this very nicely, looking at, at identity by descent as a way of identify regions of the genome that, uh, that contain rare variants contributing to disease. And then basically up here where you can consider us to be unrelated individuals, you have common variants with, with um, large effects. And at least intuitively, this is kind of how I look at the human family and, and the role of, of rare and, and common variants. The other thing that's kind of interesting is everybody thinks that these rare variants, because of the history of human genetics, are basically only in sick people. They're, you know, you, obviously they're not, they're not going to be present in these cohorts. They're only in, in sick people that you ascertain through a medical genetics clinic, and, and that is definitely not the case. It's, um, there's a couple ways of looking at this. Again, this is from the ESP um, paper that was in um, Nature recently. Is it, it's kind of interesting to look at the number of functional, or pre, again, predicted to be functional variants per individual, and it's on the order of about 1,000, a little more than 1,000. So each one of us contains about 1,000 of these, in this case, amino acid substitutions that you can use prediction algorithms, and they should be, quote, functional, whatever that means. And this goes back to what I was asking um, in the, in the previous session is what we've done is <clears throat> in a sample of ERIC, atherosclerosis risk and communities uh, participants, so we've sequenced several thousand of these individuals, and you, you find in this sample individuals that contain mutations that according to OMIM should have various phenotypes, and I've just shown you two. And so for example, so what's shown here is basically the histogram of fibrinogen in an entire sample of 16,000 individuals. And then you put onto them the individuals that contain these, these variants. And you can see in the, in the cases that I've shown here, the people that contain the variants actually sit in the tails. But you can actually find individuals that contain variants for, I'm not showing it for HDL cholesterol, for example, that basically, that although they're high, they're, they're in this entire sort of tail of the distribution. They're not, they would not be considered clinically extremely high, even though according to OMIM, they should have all of these phenotypes that you can't believe. They're, they're perfectly fine, except they have very high or very low fibrinogen or, or HDL cholesterol, for example. How do you analyze rare variants? And you know, this is probably um, well known to many of you now. The, the bottom line, and I just selected one simple example for those of you who don't do this, is you, you have to come up with some metric that collapses. And I think Peter said it very well last night. This is the way we're doing it today. If we're doing it this simply five years from now, we've probably got a problem. We've got, we've got to figure out more clever ways of, of, of combining information in, in low frequency and rare variants in a sample than simply just counts. That we're currently using counts, and counts are great, but I, there's more in the data than simply counts, and, and we need to think of more sophisticated ways of doing this. One of the things in the write-up for this meeting was sample size and power. And the bottom line, this is, these are some two slides from Susan Liao that I like to make the following point, that it, people you know, across the country and around the world have done numerous power calculations to look at sample size, and those are published, and I'm not gonna go through them. The bottom line is, you know, when, when, the, um, when the power calculation fits the, the assumptions that all of these methods fit, you know, they do fairly well, 
And when they don't, there's a lot of variation. Um, and, and so you've got to, I think we have to all be very careful of, of taking very naive power calculations and then dictating that we have to have a sample size of so many tens of thousands because we actually don't know the underlying genetic architecture and we don't know yet how we're violating those assumptions. So I, I would take some of this with a bit of a grain of salt. Then finally closing up is in this, in this Thinking about large-scale sequencing, we, we need to not be limited, I think, by exomes. We need to figure out when we're going to make the transition from exomes to whole genomes, and then, frankly, how we're going to analyze whole genomes. Um, in, in the CHARGE consortium, we've now um, sequenced 2,500 whole genomes, and by, by the end of the summer, our sample size will be 4,000. That's our target sample size. And I'm obviously not going to go through the numbers on this slide, but just shows you when you sequence whole genomes, there's a tremendous amount of variation. There's a tremendous amount of variation. And, and the, the, the goal, I think, for both study design and data analysis is how to reduce that or increase the signal-to-noise ratio and pull out uh, phenotypically um, important candidate variation and, and lower um, disease. And we're doing this a number of ways, and I'm not going to sell you on any one way. What's shown in the bottom are some metrics here about coverage and numbers of variants, and this is just a snapshot. Then what we're doing is basically having burden tests in, in annotated regions, and this happens to be a gene. Then the second thing we're doing is using ONCODE and, and oregano and basically <coughs> annotating non-coding regions, and again, then doing bur burden tests across the genome in those non-coding regions. The other is we call basically a super GWAS, is every site here is a variant that is of not rare frequency, and we can just look at those individual variants. And then the final thing we're doing is basically a, a sliding window, so a burden test, a sliding window across the entire human genome, and then looking for variable sites. And we have a few um, positive controls. And so we know this kind of strategy works, whether this is this a strategy, well, I can tell you, it is a strategy for addressing human genomes. Whether it's a very good strategy or not, I think history will tell. And, and I, I, I think certainly we all need to be thinking about how we're going to analyze um, whole genomes in, in the future. So that, that's the end, staying within time. And so the bottom line is basically the way I look at, at, at rare variants is, are these questions. And I think really as we think about sequencing in large scale cohorts, what we're doing really I forgot who made the point earlier, is, is if in arguing to sequence and not just genotype, we need to think about the, the role of novel rare variants and how we're going to use that information. So thank you. Thank you. Two minutes under. That was brilliant. Okay, great. Um, just to pick up on, on one of the points you raised, uh, Eric, let me ask you to comment on, on the issue of, of of surveying rare variants, because I think the, the issue is that we're going to always see many, many rare variants, and the question is, which ones do we pull out? Or, you know, in the, do you think that we're at a point to even consider that statistically we can, we can rely on statistics, or, uh, you know, even with weighted tests that are like, or do you think we have to, cons or are we at a position where we have to consider a lot of ancillary information, you know, corollary clinical information, ENCODE data? you know, laboratory evaluation and the like, because whatever we choose, I, I want to put two points on the table. One is we have to think about validating anything that we think is really real uh, and, and important just because there are technical issues of false positives and false negatives. And, and the second is in the validation, you know, showing that somewhere other than in the discovery set that allows us to confirm that this relationship is really robust and it's not a unique relationship only in that one individual that we'll never be able to replicate and, and sort of act upon. Well, I, have a, I mean, there are better statisticians in the audience than I am, but I like statistics. And, and uh, so I think we will rely on statistical analyses. However, unlike what we're doing today, is I think we're going to need to incorporate what you, I forgot the word you used, an, this ancillary information and bring it into the analysis, which we're, we're currently talking about for, you know, waiting by predicted function, but uh, n not very many people are doing it. So I think we need to figure out how to look at the entirety of the data and, and not just focus on a simple burden test related to cases and controls. 
the advantage of sequencing in deeply phenotyped individuals is we do have a lot of ancillary information. I think the other point is um, it's, it's not in the scope of this meeting, but I, I really think we need to think about better ways of developing functional pipelines, whether it's the mouse, the fly, the zebrafish, and complement our human studies with functional pipelines. Then the issue of validation, again, you know, Rick can talk about technical validation, and the other part of validation is kind of replication. But, uh, you know, so I think the technical validation, you know, I, I, it'll, it would kill us if we had a huge sample set and we were going to technically validate every variant that we saw. We couldn't afford to do that. That would cost us more than the parent study. But on the other hand, before making obvious um, conclusions, we would need to replicate and technically validate. But I think we have the infrastructure to do both those things. Thank you. So it's still a little bit early days in terms of the analysis of rare variants, but do you have any data? Um, so we have certain approaches for, um, for GWAS analysis of uh, correcting for population substructure for common variants. Do we have any sense at this point as to whether that degree of population, of population stratification correction is sufficient and whether we need to do super fine uh, population substructure analyses for the analyses of these rare variants? My opinion is we're going to have to be very careful with substructure because the rare variants tend to be, I'm not sure what the right word is, population or even, you know, clay I mean, specific, but I don't have good data on controlling. Lynn, do you have? Well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, this afternoon and show you at least some data, uh, although I think we're really still in the early stages of assessing it. But uh, my intuition, and I think that of a lot of others, is that because rare variants are more likely to be population specific, we're likely to need more fine-tuned population data for our background, for our background uh, samples. Yeah, I mean, just looking at the thousand genome data, I mean, you know, and as you look at the population privacy as you go from group to group, it just, you know, that becomes such a high proportion of, of the variation. and so. You know, some of the studies, like in, in Norway, where they've been looking at, you know, BRCA mutations and the like, it's very interesting. You know, they can map who's on the north side, the south side, and the west side of a relatively small country, just seeing the additional rare variants along the haplotypes of some of the, quote unquote, more commonly known BRCA1 mutations. And so, you know, how we will control for that, again, comes back to this question, can, can we use the discovery set for action? Or our, as we get rarer and rarer, do we face this very, very difficult, you know, question of having to have independence or going somewhere else to interpret and, you know, and confirm what we see as we can take that into account and, you know, and, and use population genetics history and, and, and various ways of, of, of organizing information to, to really confirm or see whether that is really a passenger as opposed to a real driver of what we're looking at. Just, um, I, this was a question I meant to ask Peter last night, but, but Eric, you, you raised it again, which is the power question. Which is a power question, and, and it's one I can't answer because not not a statistician. But um, but when we were putting together the ESP project, and then you, you listed all the other projects, the diabetes, et cetera, um, I think that there were some very very smart people who made power calculations uh, about estimations of what the sample size would be needed to um, detect a, a a meaningful effect from a low frequency allele, and as you pointed out. Um, while the projects are still going, et cetera, um, I don't think we are having this this kind of treasure trove of findings that, that are necessarily coming out. Now we have um, that large number of, relatively larger number of whole exomes when, when you piece together all of those projects, plus you have exome chip being genotyped in, in well over 100,000 individuals through several different um, ICs, like the NHLBI, I could probably count probably a number of cohorts that probably together would add, add up to 50, 70,000 um, individuals. So I think we probably in the next six months would have data where we could actually make power calculations based on actual data rather than just on, on some hypo hypothetical. So I guess I would, I would say it may well be a good idea to think about how, how we could collaboratively across the different institutes um, gather those power, power estimates with real data 
so that the, the true sample size for, the, for, these cohort, for this cohort or, or sample sequencing could actually be based on data. I, I completely agree. Um, I think we all know that we should be a bit skeptical of uh, power calculations in grad applications. Uh, uh, power calculations require assumptions about how big the effects are. And uh, as you said, in the early days of sequencing, I think we're a bit op more optimistic about the sizes of effects that there might be for lower frequency and rare variants. Uh, and there's a lot of empirical evidence that we were overly optimistic and that there aren't things of the size that we thought. Uh, Eric's two examples on the quantitative traits uh, where you pick things that Omim said were interesting and they were in the tails. If you try to do that experiment the other way around, if you said, would you learn from this data that they were interesting, I'm pretty sure the answer is no uh, with this kind of sample size. So it's, I mean, there's a general point. One of the things that's come out of the sequencing studies is that there are lots of rare variants. Some people find that kind of surprising and exciting. I think it's not so surprising. But anyway, there are lots of rare variants. What we don't know yet uh, is how bigger contribution they'll make and how big their effects are for common diseases, except that we have partial information from all these large studies that those effects aren't as large as we might have hoped when we did the power calculation for the studies we're currently doing. Um, and I completely, you know, I think the empirical data is now pretty strong that we need large sample size. Eric, when you said the problem with power calculations for various statistical methods is if you make the assumptions of the methods are designed to pick up on the power calculations look good, I can, and in general that won't be the case. Then you said, uh, so maybe we should be a bit skeptical about power calculations that say we need large sample sizes. Is that what you're saying? I mean, that, that it was more, sorry, it was more than just sample sizes. It was also the, the many, many other assumptions that go into those power calculations that we don't know if they're true. You know, for example, the, the direction of effect is always the same, when indeed in the same gene you can have variants that send you in both directions. Things like that, I think, concern me in addition to the sample size. So, so I completely agree with all those concerns, but the consequence of them is that we'll need larger studies than, those power than even those power calculations might suggest. Absolutely. Yeah. That was, yeah, that was the end. So the, we need to know how big the effects are of rare variants that contribute to the diseases we're interested in. We can either hypothesize about that, which is what we've been doing, and we've got it wrong, I think, or we can find rare variants that contribute and use real data. But we haven't found many rare variants that contribute yet, so I'm not quite sure what you mean by using can I jump? But we've relied on hypothesis testing. Just take the point estimates in the, in the samples we have today. Not If we take only those that have a p-value of greater than 10 to the minus, pick a number then I think we're going to actually get that same bias back into our calculations. That we're going to, but we, we just take the point estimates independent of p-values and use those point estimates to generate. Of, of effects of particular variants or sets of variants within a What do you mean by point estimates of, Burden. of a set of variants within a gene? Because that's not. Well, I mean, you could do it several ways. I mean, the whole point of this is, you know, trying to discover what that space is going to look like. And, you know, we know that there is, you know, pleiotropy in the, on the phenotype side as well. But I think that it would be to have very large numbers, like the 65,000 or so, and ask questions of just about everybody would have something like BMI or something related to that, where you would at least be able to look and see what, what you're able to discover to what, you know, what allele frequency and what effect size, at least what's showing up in the agnostic analysis. Now, whether there are a lot of false positives or not, as you go further down, you're going to need, you know, additional data sets to really establish that. Because again, you know, it's this question of discovery and, and validation, but at least to know what you really would see with very, very large numbers. So, so I think uh, the way I think about it, we can use current data to put bounds on what the effects would be by arguing that if the effects were bigger than this, we should have seen them and we haven't seen them. Uh, if we try and do point estimates, uh, the problem is, uh, so, and the, the other good thing to do would be to find real things, and then we've at least got some examples of the kinds of things we're looking for and what their effect sizes are. We haven't got very far with doing that. 
One worry with point estimates, I completely agree with all of the earlier discussion that population structure is likely to be a much bigger issue with uh, sequencing data than it is with ge has been with GOS data. Um, and that will confound point estimates. So you don't quite know if you do point estimates in the presence of confounding whether you're actually estimating the disease effect or you're estimating something else. So it's a bit scary, I think. It's a couple of sort of comments from a totally non statistical geneticist. One is um, for Chris, a ton of exome sequencing and a ton of exome chips. Uh, do you have a, a good handle on the phenotypes? And that's the other. Part of the that's I mean if you're going to do this this million person cohort uh, it seems to me that, that there are two two issues one is the genotyping and the other is is how good the phenotypes are and I'll just sort of leave that open because I know we're going to talk about that this afternoon the 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 other question or comment for Eric was what is rare is rare a one off or is rare sort of a 0.1 percent because because one off, I think you're going to have really great trouble figuring out what the phenotypes are unless they're really exotic and obvious. But if, they're start, if you start to sort of look at, at rare meaning 1% or 0.1%, you might actually be able to get to a phenotype if you have that phenotype annotated somehow. And then the third comment is this business of binning really irritates me because even in my little pharmacogenetics world or my arrhythmia world, we find rare variants in the same gene, some of which are hypomorphic and some of which are hyper morphic, and the idea of sort of binning all that together because they're all variant, uh, I find it's sort of, uh, it's, it, it has to be at best a, something before a first approximation. Just comments. Well, I think that just reinforces that we're, we're using counts today, and, and, and counts are good, but if we need to use other information to improve how we do it going forward, I think everybody would agree with that. Just to address the, the phenotype, I, I only know what's in the sort of NHLBI space for the most part, but within that space we have a number of cohorts, so you have cohort data with, which is pretty high resolution quantitative trait phenotyping and some disease traits like myocardial infarction is one that's getting, that's, that's receiving attention. So I, I think it's well phenotyped and probably would represent the, the, the highest resolution phenotyping that would probably be available. But if those patients have some exotic form of malignancy, you might or might not find that. Uh, you, that, that isn't being measured, you mean? Right. Correct. Uh, so I, I guess there's a, there's a potential elephant in the room when, as we start talking about cohorts with very, very deep phenotype data or broad phenotype data, and that's the multiple testing burden that that imposes. Uh, the, the power calculations that, that Peter presented, which are depressing in and of themselves, relate, relate to what you see with a single discrete phenotype. If, if you're measuring a thousand different phenotypes across a cohort, those power calculations move from depressing to incredibly depressing. And I, uh, I just think that, that's right, with a million phenotypes it gets, it gets obviously much worse. So, so there, is, uh, there is a danger that by measuring too many phenotypes within a cohort in a gene discovery context, you actually reduce your power to find association for any one of those phenotypes. So there is, a, I, don't know, I don't know there's an easy solution to that, but I just think it's something we need to consider in, in this context. I wouldn't, Although it's always been argued that the number of genetic tests dwarfs the number of phenotypes, <laughs> even if you have a thousand phenotypes, we but you know. <laughs> I wouldn't be quite so depressed. I mean, because I, uh, I mean, I, uh, again, the question is, what is this first study? It's a discovery, it's, it's not, giving you the completely wrapped, finished picture that you're going to go talk to a patient the next day on the basis of that one sequencing. I mean, so, you know, the history of genetics is we live with false positives. I mean, they're our best friends, so to speak. You know, we wish they weren't in the room, but we, as we, as we go through, you know, linkage, GWAS, now sequencing, we always carry false positives. But it's the second and third analysis that winnows out those things that we say, hmm, that was a false positive. These are the true variants that we think are really worth pursuing or putting into the next paradigm. So again, this is where numbers and thresholds become very important in this rare variant sequencing world to be able to go look elsewhere and, and, and try and establish those things over a series of studies. Because no one sequencing study by itself, unless we sequenced all 300 million Americans and had perfect phenotypes for them, and then we were able to just sort of start to play in that, in that, in that field. But that's not going to happen. 
But, but given the, the topic of, of Eric's talk, which was finding rare variants for, for complex diseases, I, I think that, you know, Dan's issue of what if it's just a one-off, how do you know? Um, and and I, I think the way we've tried to deal with that in the past is to look at all the existing databases and say, well, if it's been seen before, it probably isn't related to the disease. And, and that's probably not the best approach, particularly for, for more, more subtle things or, or form fruits. Um, and, and it seems as though the 65,000 people that we've been batting around here uh, would, would be a fabulous reference population if only we could put them all together with all the recommendations we have for doing that to be able to go in and then query and say, okay, do they really, do, do these people with this PCSK9, for instance, um, do they all have LDL cholesterol or lowish, you know, LDL, that, that sort of thing that would, would, I think, inform some of this. And then similarly, Similarly, wanting to go back and rephenotype those people, which is, you know, involves a whole host of complexities. But if you had a group that was actually large enough and agreed to, to be rephenotyped, like the UK10K or, or other kinds of groups, that, that you, you could indeed go back, find those people um, based on their genotype, and then phenotype them, that might solve this problem, wouldn't it? Or at least help Should address it? Yeah. So on that hopeful note, Okay, one comment. Oh yeah, no, I, I completely agree with Terry, and I think it uh, it means there's there's tremendous power in in these cohorts from a validation perspective. It just means we need to be careful about how we think about them from a discovery perspective. Yeah. So three hopeful notes. Michelle J. Quish at HLBI. Um, two issues that have been brought up just now. One is huge sample size and power, and the other is what if it's a one-off. We've also talked about family studies, but nobody's integrating this. And I'm wondering, do we need these huge sample sizes if we're looking at families for rare variants? Because rare variants cluster in families when we're looking at transmission, not association. Families are a good way to show that it's not just a, a de novo mutation. So people keep bringing up family studies, but they're not really talking about how it would uh, be brought into such a study design. Hold that thought for the general discussion. We have to move on. Magnus will tell, will talk to us about mod genetic modifiers in complex diseases. <laughs>